And before we move on to our first set of riffs, I want to talk about the sound, because uh, this is one of the best, uh, most unique guitar sounds in all of rock guitar history. Uh, and it was rather, it's rather difficult to get precisely. Um, number one, it starts out with a Les Paul. Well, let me, let me mention to you that if you don't have all this gear, don't worry about it. The important thing is to play the music and have a good time doing it. But let's cover the sound a little bit. So I'm starting out with a Les Paul. Uh, I'm running into an old Marshall 100 watt that I had modified, but Tom Schultz used to think, used a thing called a, a, an attenuator, okay? And what he used to do is turn his amps up real loud and then attenuate the volume coming out of it so that the sound coming out of the speakers wouldn't be so loud that it's unusable. Uh, as far as the microphone would go. So then he used to double his guitars a lot. In other words, play one on one side and play one on the other. And he used a lot of uh, mids around 500 hertz. Okay, so if you have a little EQ pedal, put a little bit of 500 low mids in it, and it gives you something that sounds nose. It's got a lot of nose in it. That's, that's how I usually term it. It's got a lot of chorus and a lot of reverb on it. Okay, and all of that's coming from the mix board behind me. Okay. Um, We'll get a little bit more into detail maybe later about the sound. But uh, like I said, don't worry about it if you don't have all this stuff. The important thing is to play the music and have a good time. Okay, well, let's get on with it. Here's riff number one. Once again. On this next riff, we're going to keep this same sound. There were, there's basically three sounds on the tape. We've got distorted sounds, we've got clean sounds, and we have acoustic sounds. And we play, we'll be playing our acoustic guitar in a little while and we'll also be playing just definite clean tones but for the second one what you can do is back the volume way down on your guitar some chorusing and some reverb and you'll achieve this tone okay riff two <laughs> Once again. Riff three. Once again. Here on Riff 4, what we have are something called harmonics, okay? What you do is you place your finger very lightly over whatever fret it is, 12th fret, 7, 5, as where they occur normally. They occur anywhere on the neck. You can slide your hand up and down the neck and get, get harmonics anywhere you want, but they usually occur at 12, 7, and 5. Uh, right on the fret, lightly touch and let go. Okay, so here's riff four. Riff four.
once again. Tom Schultz, um, who wrote all these songs, and uh, the, the main albums that we're covering are like one and two here, um, had this sense of melody that was incredible. And he wrote, uh, he wrote all these songs with these, these great, um, they weren't leads, they were just melodies to hook these songs together. And, uh, and this is one of them. This is these, the, his sense of melody was very keen. And he used to take these sounds and double them, and they'd be big and large in these melodies. And then Brad Delp, the singer, would wash in and sing over the tops of them and sustain and all kinds of cool stuff. So here's riff five. Riff five. <laughs> Once again. Riff six. Once again. Of seven. Once again. Riff A. Once again. Riff nine.
once again. Riff 10. Once again. Here on Riff 11, what we have is a different set of effects. Um, this is right in, in the bridge of one of these songs, and they used to take a lot of time recording these songs, okay? So what would happen was, Tom Schultz would craft these tunes and then put them on tape with whatever layers he felt like putting on, and there had to be, geez, there had to be at least 48 tracks of this stuff back when, back when there were only 24-track tape decks, and they had to go through all kinds of pains to lock them together and bounce them down. But anyways, this is one of those particular tracks that has on it, it has a... Uh, a slap back reverb, okay? A very heavy flange on it and some chorusing and it's split into stereo and it fades up under on, on w while they're mixing it down, it fades up underneath everything. So, like I said, while these things are complicated if you're trying to reproduce them exactly, um, the, the important thing is to get the part down and have fun playing the part, okay? Here's Riff 11. Riff 11. Once again. Once again. Once again.
Riff 14. Once again. Riff 15. Once again. Riff 16. Once again. Riff 17. Once again. Riff 18. Once again. Riff 19.
once again. Twenty. Once again. Once again. Once again. Once again. Tom Schultz can play the heck out of an organ. I imagine he still can. Um, and what's going to happen here is uh, we're going to—I'm going to show you that the uh, back up to the organ solo in this one. Okay. So here's how this goes. Riff Once again. Here on Riff 24, we're playing this little rhythmic pattern um, that, in, that involves having a phase shifter on it. The phase shifter is turned about, I don't know, 10 o'clock. Okay? Here we go. Riff 24. Once again. Twenty-eight. 
Once again. Now, when I was a younger lad, and I used to play this stuff uh, in bands, actually, I was never in a band who could sing it, so I used to play it for my own entertainment. But. When I was a younger lad and used to play this stuff for my own entertainment, um, what used to happen was I always wondered why the, these sets of songs were in F. Because everything's played in E, you know what I mean? E or A, if you're a rocker and you play guitar, you play in E or A. And I met a keyboard player who could do this organ part, okay? And it's in A minor. Now, it occurs to me that if it starts off in A minor and it ends up in F, that the whole thing is a half a step out and this entire set of songs here was recorded a whole half step slower and moved up a half step fast for effect I guess but that's why everything sounds so crisp and clean uh, because it's impossible to play on the keyboard I play a little bit of keyboard it's, po it's impossible to play it on the keyboard in the key that you'd be in if you were in playing the whole thing in F but what I did was I showed it to you the way it is on the CD so that if you want to you can play along alright here's the next set of riffs Twenty six. Once again. Seven. again. Tom Schultz used to do this a lot. He did this a lot on the first album, 
and he did a lot before he got the Rockman going. And what the Rockman did was the Rockman took all this sound, and, and you got to understand something. When a Marshall's producing a sound, or any amplifier is producing a sound, it's going through a speaker. The speaker's moving air, okay? The microphone's picking up the air movement. When you take a sound processor and plug it straight into a mixer and run that to tape, there's no air being, in, being moved, no air involved, except for the air hitting your face from the speakers you're listening from after it's all done being mixed. Now that cuts out an integral part of what the sound is as far as I'm concerned, and it also doesn't allow you to do this particular thing, which is I'm going to turn up the amps, and I'm going to turn up the speakers behind me here really loud, and I'm going to show you how to get this sustain. And what you do is you've got to stand in a certain place, and you have to have quite just the right sound. You've got to have quite a bit of distortion, and you uh, hold on to these notes until they, go, until they go into feedback. And what's occurring is the speaker is reacting with the pickup, and is causing the, the string to vibrate on its own because the, uh, mag the magnetism between the pickup and the speaker is causing the whole thing to occur. Okay, let's go on to the next rip. Once again. Once again. On this next set of riffs, uh, we're going to go to a clean sound, a completely clean sound. I plugged into an amplifier that has no distortion. It's yet another Marshall. Uh, I'm not sure what Tom Schultz was using. Pl probably a Marshall because you can get a relatively... Back then when he was distorting his amps, like I said, he was turning them up a real loud and attenuating them. I have a gain modification in mind, and it's a whole different thing. It's like plugging a distortion pedal in, but it's a good sounding one. I had it done by a guy who does them real well. So I plugged into another amplifier that has nothing but clean sound, and I'm running the same types of chorusing and the same types of reverbs. And uh, when he recorded them, he put one in, on each side one and doubled them. And, and so if I were to do this sound by myself, I'd have an A-B setup. I'd run a Marshall with distortion, a Marshall with clean sound, and uh, I'd have a chorus pedal for both sounds and some slapback to layer some reverb uh, plugged into both sounds. Okay, and I would use those judiciously whenever it was required. All right, let's get on with it. Twenty nine. Once again. On these sounds, I want you to, to, to uh, notice something. We're always using the bridge pickup on these. A lot of people use the, the either the the tone between them. On Les Paul, you got three tones. You got the neck pickup, you got the tone between the two pickups, and you got the bridge pickup. These tones happen to be, and a lot of them are double with acoustics too, by the way. But these always happen to be the bridge pickup. Okay, let's move on. Riff thirty. 
Once again. Once again. Alright, on the last wrist we're going to do here, I'm going to be playing my Martin, my trusty Martin. I have a 51 Martin, it's my favorite, this is my favorite guitar in the whole wide world. Um, and we're going to be doing the acoustic stuff. What's cool about all these songs is you can play most of them on an acoustic guitar, then you put yank one out of your closet and have a good time playing these things. Um, uh, the thing about acoustic guitars too is that, that depending upon the size of pick you use, you'll get a different sound. These are being played with a medium pick. Real strummy stuff, you should probably play with a thin pick, and it gives you, a, it gives you the ability to strum without hitting the strings too hard. Um, but let's get on with it. Here's our next set of riffs. 31. Once again. Once again. Riff 32. Once again. Once again. For thirty three. Once again.
once again. Thirty-four. Once again. Once again. Once again. Once again. That about wraps it up. Um, if the tablature is too difficult to read, there's an address at the end here that you can write to to get a copy of it that's much larger, that's easier to read. Um, there's a song to jam to at the end. Um, Tom Schultz used to use, uh, or he put out, he was an electrician by trade and, and a musician too, and he had all this stuff conglomerated in, in together. And This first album was a landmark. The first album was a landmark in guitar sound. And still, to this day, in my opinion, has not been beaten as far as him, he, even himself. These guitar sounds are much better than the ones he got with the Rockman. But if you want an instant Tom Schultz sound, and you can find them, I'm not sure they make them anymore, a Rockman is Tom Schultz in a box. So it's uh, kind of easy to get. I used to, they used to be great practice amps, uh, by the way. Anyways, uh, make sure that... Uh, you don't worry too much about all these sounds and just try to get the stuff down and have some fun playing your favorite songs. I sure did have a good time making these. Uh, tell you what, until next time, I'm Kurt Mitchell, and I'll see you later.